that he knew and, and different relatives of ours from Romania. Um, but I remember distinctly, my great grandfather was always listening to music, and when I was with him, music was constantly playing. There was one friend of his that when he came over, there was never music in the house. No music. And I always thought that was really, really weird as this old man. And I became pretty fascinated with this old man for reasons which I'm going to tell you in just a moment. Um, and I, I asked my great grandpa to tell me about him. Um, and I eventually became friends with him. This man was the greatest rhythmic genius that this world has ever known. The greatest rhythmic genius that this world has ever known. He was born tone deaf. So music sounded like screeching to him, just senseless screeching, but that wasn't why he didn't like music. He didn't like music because the rhythms in music were too repetitive and too simple, and they drowned out the rhythms that he lived on hearing because he was born tone deaf, colorblind, so he couldn't see colors, dyslexic, um, so he didn't learn to read until a very advanced age, and he didn't learn to speak until he was five. What he spent his childhood listening to was this. He could hear and recognize rhythms that were so complex that he could hear the rhythm of one person breathing against the rhythm of another person breathing against the rhythm of the vowel sounds and consonants in someone's voice against the sounds of clattering dishes against the sounds of crickets chirping outside against the sound of the wind and plates crashing and every single given thing in a moment of time, he could hear a distinct rhythm in those things. And so he was fascinated with listening to these rhythms. And his parents fought constantly when he was a kid. His parents fought constantly. And he noticed that when his parents were unhappy and there was fighting, there was a very distinct kind of rhythm, a very specific, distinct kind of rhythm. Now there were these days that were amazing where time just stretched out and he felt so safe and so happy and so incredible and they were like the longest afternoons and he could play and invariably the whole thing led to ice cream and his parents were even really happy and he noticed that those moments, those kinds of moments, had another very distinct kind of rhythm, very distinct. And so as a child, he began doing was that he began experimenting. When his parents were fighting and things were really, really bad, he began breathing in a certain rhythm and tapping his foot and moving his spoon around and coughing a little bit in the good rhythm against the bad rhythm, trying to turn the bad rhythm into the good rhythm. And what he found was that as he began doing that, everyone in the room unconsciously couldn't help but join into rhythm with him. And as a group, they would change the bad rhythm into a good rhythm, and his parents would stop fighting, and they'd get happy, and invariably it would lead to ice cream. <laughs> And when he grew up, he did really well with girls. <laughs> and by the time that I met him, he just wandered around the world going to awful places where people were sad and things were horrible and scary. And he would just, he could walk into a cafe where people were miserable, an awful place, a diner, and in a place that was dangerous and terrible. And he'd just sit down and he'd move his spoon around He'd shift in his seat, the sound of the ruffling of the fabric of his pants. He'd open and close the door, and suddenly, without saying a thing to anyone, the entire feeling in the room would change to something so vast and so wonderful that everyone would get so happy in this way that's lasting. It stays with you forever. I, I can feel it always, and, and, and he could do this as an old man by changing the rhythms and spaces. And what happened was, was that as he got older and older, he started going to places that were more and more dangerous and I started seeing my great-grandfather get more and more upset when, when, when he would visit. 
And, and finally, the last time they were together, they fought. And even I knew what it was about because he was planning to go someplace that was incredibly dangerous, where bombs were dropping, where there was a war, where people were dying. And he was probably going to die. There was no going to this place without dying. And he was a very old man. And I remember that he started trying to change the rhythm in the room, and my grandfather wouldn't let him because we both knew what he was trying to do, and we wouldn't let him do it because we were both furious at him for going, and we were trying to talk him out of going, and he knew he couldn't change the rhythm in the room that time for us. And he did go, and, and, and though he was a very old man, he did not die of old age, and I, I won't say where he died or, or what it was. But the one thing that he said before he went was that it was very important to him that the story of his life and that his life have a very specific rhythm and that therefore he had to be available and ready to die on beat at the exact moment the rhythm called for and therefore he had to be always in the presence of death. And he did die and all I can say is that it worked because every time I've ever told this story to anybody it's happened. The rhythm in the room has changed. And not only that, but everyone that I've ever told this story to who's told it to someone else has had the exact same thing happen. And as he was walking away the last time I ever saw him, and we wouldn't let him change the rhythm in the room, he smiled at us as he was walking out of the house. And he did the one thing that I never thought I'd ever hear him do in his own tone deaf way. He hummed us a tune. Yeah. Uh -huh.